Thursday, the 25th of October. It's been an October of high drama and it seems to be wrapping up with one anyway before the commentary begins we're up right and bright and early good morning and welcome to the morning brief right here on channels television i am bukola koka and i'm jeff rosama by the way it's 24th bukola where are you going to oh. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that we you, don't get that you, you you can't wait for the month to end at the, at the oh end. yeah we, we we all can't wait it's actually the 24th 24th so. of october thank you so there's a lot being a lot has been going on. Dramatic, the, right, Jeffrey? Dramatic things happening in the country, especially I think the big one has to do. And we're going to dwell on that. You can trust us on this particular issue that has to do with the reshuffling of the cabinet. And I've seen hoopurial reactions, like a flurry of reactions, some against, some for, some in between, and all of that. So what we will do is to allow the people to have their say as much as possible. So it is not too late for you to go to X. Let's make that announcement quite early. <laughs> and let's get your reaction as far as the issue of the president. Uh, cabinet shakeup is concerned. So uh, for a starter, in case you were not following what's going on in the country, the president has fired about five ministers. So if you do the calculation very well, it's actually six because Better Aiju apparently is not returning. So if you add uh, Better Aiju to that list, it's six. Uh, but our name wasn't mentioned anywhere. Uh, we don't know what's going on with the investigation as far as the issue of that ministry is concerned. But officially from the government, five persons, uh, so that's that you see them from uh, women, of, women Affairs to uh, Tourism, Education, and the rest of them, including the Minister for Youth Development, and I think State for Housing and all of that. So we have uh, five of them, no longer cabinet members, and we have uh, seven coming in at the end of the day, and then we have about 10 of them being reassigned to different ministries. Uh, Bukola, when you saw the list, uh, what was your impression? Oh, well, uh, the, the presidency had hinted that this was coming. Mm. Um, it was sort of an anticlimax for me uh, because um, the talks of cost, cutting cost of governance has been on, you know, forever. Mm. It's, not, uh, it's not starting with this administration. You know, so with the president... Um, hiring seven, but firing five, um, it, it missed the mark really. Uh, so where is the objective of, you know, a more effective administration uh, with the, you know, approach of cutting waste, where is that, you know, coming through? Uh, of course, we'll put, up, put through these questions, but there's also uh, the issue about competence, you know, what's the pedigree of those who have been hired, and then the redeployment of some uh, ministers to other you know, ministries. Uh, we'll put through all of those questions to those who should be answering them. But the president has indeed ex exercised his executive powers. And, you know, the administration is continuously being put on test, on the test about, you know, um, you know, the promises that he'd said it would deliver on. And every day really is a test for this administration. And, um, uh, posterity, of course, will indeed judge because the president told us uh, during the campaign that this was his lifelong ambition. So uh, what's the president doing with his lifelong ambition and how well are uh, his foot soldiers helping to interpret this um, um, renewed hope agenda are indeed the poor breathing in the country because at the end of the day, uh, that's the objective of it all. But uh, let's scrutinize this new outlook of the Bola Tinubu cabinet. Jeffrey. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I looked at the list and I was just smiling. Uh, well, I, I agree with you. Uh, from, from the outset, this, this side, the size of the number of ministries, I know they merge one, scrapped one, and then repurposed the other one. But at the end of the day, the ministries are too many. Uh, the ministers are excessively too many. We don't have money to fund all of this. Statutorily, we should have 36 ministers. Uh, by law, and then every other one is the discretion of the president. He can choose to hire and fire whoever he wants. So size for me is big. There are so many people in President Balatinubu's cabinet that should not be there, that are still there. Yes, you can say, okay, some of the ones that have been fired, okay. But I don't know how the politi politicians within this cabinet survive. I, if, if you allow me, I'm, I can mention a couple of them that should be fired like yesterday. They should have left this cabinet. But I don't know the metrics for which the president is using to measure maybe uh, the performance of these ministers, or he's also having political consideration, because there are some of them that are underwhelming in their performance. Some don't have any business being ministers. They are not qualified by any form besides being citizens and all of that. 
because the job at hand requires the best of mind, the brightest of brain, and the people that has the greatest of wisdom to be at that seat or be in the cabinet of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. But I must commend the president for seeing the urgency to reshuffle the cabinet. But the outcome, well, not quite impressive. But Bukola, let's Jeffrey, tell the people what we have for you. Uh, let's leave the guests to do the analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why I didn't mention any name. The, okay. guests, oh, the guests will have to mention the names. But yeah. you and I know what we're talking about. Indeed, but we've given you a tip of the iceberg. So that's where we're starting from. The much anticipated cabinet reshuffle has finally been effected with the president's sacking of five ministers, nomination for appointment of seven minister designates and reassignment of 10 other ministers. We see upgrades, downgrades and returnees plus scrapping of ministries and merging of others. Will the shakeup inspire better performance and efficiency? We dig deep into this matter. Well, that will not be all we're talking about. I know that's the biggest headline as far as the uh, nation of Nigeria is concerned, and we're going to dig deep uh, with the expert. But we will head out to the southeast region of Nigeria that has struggled to respond effectively to the sit-at-home order enforced by the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, calling for secession. But state governors in the region appear to uh, try and make attempt to reverse all of that. Uh, by building confidence in the people. This thing has crippled businesses and mobilities, especially on Monday in places like Anambra, uh, Imo, Eboni, uh, Abia, and the rest of the Southeast state. So we're going to look at all of that today. What is going on? This confidence building measure by the governors, is it really working or is it just a photo op? We'll find out right here on the program. And that's not all. We explore the journey of one of Nollywood's Big movie product producers, um, Jikeve Oguja. Yes, that's uh, the person joining me now, joining us today. Uh, so, the Nollywood minefield. Um, how are we, you know, positioning ourselves to ensure that the creatives in the country own more of it, rather than, um, you know, the international companies taking up most of the shares. And of course, we'll also be looking at his own creative journey as well. So. Join us for that big conversation. But it's going to be a big one. We always like to do it like this. Towards the end of the program, we'll keep things light. So we're going to start very heavy, extremely heavy with all the national issues. And then we we'll tone things down. But also in the creative space. And by the way, I realized that uh, Sunday Diary is back. Uh, but this time, it's not necessarily. So communication. So communication. Yeah. I, I like the language they use in the office of the Honorable Minister. <laughs> but we'll take a quick break. Politics is interesting. Mr. Jeffrey, is it a promotion? <laughs> Oh, we'll, ask. <laughs> we'll take a quick break. When we come back, I'm going to bring you the top stories. Join us again. Welcome back. So top on the brief this morning is the loss of job for five ministers who have been sacked by President Bola Tinubu following a cabinet shakeup that sees appointment of seven new ministers designate and the reassignment of 10 others. Those are no longer cabinet members. Who are no longer cabinet members include Minister of Women Affairs, Uju Ohaneye, Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Maman, Minister of Tourism, Lola Ade John. Others are Minister of Youth Development, Dr. Jamila Bio Ibrahim, and Abdullahi Mohammed Gwarzo, who served as Minister of State, Housing, and Urban Development. Some of the new appointees include Dr. Nentawe Yilwatda as Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Reduction, and Mrs. Bianca Ono Ujuku as Minister of State, Foreign Affairs, and Dr. Jumoke Oduwole as Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, while Idi Mukhtar Maiha will take charge in the newly created Ministry of Livestock Development. Meanwhile, the President also scrapped the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs to create the Ministry of Regional Development that will oversee regional interventionist agencies. The Ministry of Sports Development was also scrapped to allow the National Sports Commission manage the sector as the Ministry of Tourism has now been merged with that of arts, culture and creative economy. Now for the full list of ministers reassigned, kindly visit our website channelstv.com. More from the FCT. The federal government has dropped all charges against an executive uh, at Binance Holdings, Mr. Tigran Gambarian, on health grounds, as Mr. Gambarian has been facing money laundering trial from detention since April. A counsel 
for the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission announced the withdrawal of the charges at the Federal High Court Abuja before Justice Emeka Unwiti. The hearing came two days before the October the 25th, earlier scheduled as the return date by the trial judge in the open court last Friday. The lawyer said Mr. Gambarian, a United States citizen, was merely an employee of Binance, whose activities he was being prosecuted for, and counsel to Mr. Gambarian, Mark Modi, agreed with the prosecution, saying that his client was not involved in the company's broader financial decisions. And Governor Hyacinth Ali of Benue State has suspended the Attorney General and Commissioner of Justice and Public Order, Mr. Fidelis, Minyam for joining states challenging that the establishment of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission and the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offences Commission. Addressing journalists after the State Executive Council, Governor Alia wondered why Benue State will join the League of States challenging the status of the anti-graft agencies who are working to help his administration recover funds allegedly, allegedly diverted by the past administration. He accused the suspended State Attorney General, Mr. Imyam, of working autonomously without first clearing from his administration. Benue State has been robbed by past uh, government and we're only trying to see how we can get something back to develop the state. We have been deprived of our own financial resources here in the state. So why all of a sudden my administration will get back there, you know, to take the EFCC that is even helping the state, or the ICPC that is helping the state, you know, to do some recovery of what is stolen from the state? We are looking for money to develop the state. So why would we go back to say that we are taking these people to the, I mean, to, I mean, to the court for, for prescription? That is not the position of Benue State. And I we strongly feel that if we just let that go, our uh, lessons will not be learned here. Therefore, the Commissioner uh, Attorney, of, uh, of uh, Justice and Attorney General for the state uh, has to pay quite dearly for this. Any person who is representing the state and you are sent out to do any meetings or to hold forth for the state must revert to the state. In the meantime, the House of Representatives has directed its Committee on Power to investigate the frequent national grid collapses and provide a report within three weeks. This decision followed a motion of urgent national importance raised by Honorable Mansur Manu Soru from Bauchi State. During the plenary and in his motion, Honorable Soru says he is concerned over the persistent grid failures which have plunged the entire country into a blackout and worsened the economic challenges already faced by Nigerians. He stressed that stable power supply is essential for driving economic growth and development in any nation. That the entire states in the northeast, northwest, and some part of the north central zones have been has been thrown into darkness over the last two days in what the transmission company of Nigeria TCN described as faulty transmission lines. To mandate the House Committee on Power to investigate this unending power grid collapse and the House Legislative Committee on Compliance to ensure compliance. In the meantime, their colleague at the upper chamber uh, their colleagues, rather, have called for a nation summit to address the challenges of out-of-school children following their meeting with President Bola Tinubu. Uh, this resolution was taken during plenary after the submission of reports of the Committee on Education, Basic and Secondary, on the compelling need to tackle the menace of out-of-school children in Nigeria. Chairman of the committee, Senator Usman Adamu, representing Kaduna Central, disclosed that over two million out-of-school children have been enrolled in the last one year through the collective efforts of the agencies of the Ministry of Ministry working on out-of-school children and education. The committee considered the submission from the Ministry of Education and observed that there is urgent need to hit the ground and activate the roadmap of the federal government on curtail 
the out of school children. So that the result to have a national summit on the issue of out of school children to bring a holistic solution to the menace of out of school children in Nigeria. Those in support of the motion say aye. aye. And those again say nay. The eyes have it. And to other issues now, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Gas, Iparikwe Epo, has voiced serious concerns over the continuing rise in the price of liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, commonly known as cooking gas in the country. Despite various measures implemented to address the issue, prices have so far remained unstable, recently jumping from an average of 1,100 naira to 1,500 naira per kilogram. The minister has directed that effective from November 1, 2024, the NNPCL and LPG producers must halt the export of LPG produced domestically for or import equivalent volumes at cost-reflective prices, while the NMDPRA will work with stakeholders to establish a domestic LPG pricing framework within 90 days. It is expected that within the next 12 months, all the facilities necessary to blend, store, and take delivery of LPG produced in country will be in place and effectively put an end to export of LPG until a time when the market has attained sufficiency and acceptable price stability. C, that NMDPRA within the next 90 days should engage stakeholders within the gas industry and produce the domestic LPG pricing framework as stipulated in section 122 of the PIA, indexing the allowable cost of domestic cooking gas to the price of producing the commodity in country, rather than the current practice of indexing against external markets, such as the Americas and Far East Asia, whereas the commodity is produced in country and the Nigerian people are required to pay a much higher price for an essential commodity we are so endowed with. Outside our shores now, the U.S. Vice President and Presidential Candidate of the Democratic Party, Kamala Harris, has says Donald Trump wants unchecked power. She made the statement while addressing comments um, that his former chief of staff made about him being dictatorial. In an interview published with the New York Times, John Kelly was quoted to have said his former boss once told him, you know, Hitler did some good things too. Harris is returning to Pennsylvania before she appears at a town hall event as she rallies voters ahead of the November polls. And in sports, up until yesterday afternoon, we had a Ministry of Sports Development with a substantive minister, but things changed very quickly. Later in the day, when the presidency announced that the immediate winding up of the Ministry of Sports Development following a cabinet shakeup, as you heard in our earlier story. And in a statement on the restructuring of ministries and ministerial portfolios, President Tinubu approved the transfer of its functions to the National Sports Commission in order to develop a vibrant sports economy. President Tinubu also appointed Mr. Shehu Diko as chairman of the National Sports Commission to oversee the role and pundits have been assessing that development. Meanwhile, the immediate past Minister of Sports, Senator John Owaneno, has now been reassigned as the Minister of Trade, Industry and Development, while his predecessor, Mr. Sunday Dari, returned as Special Advisor to the President on Public Communication and Orientation, working from the Ministry of Information and National Orientation. So many interesting developments and what are your thoughts to these big stories from the cabinet shakeup to the calls by the Senate uh, to have a national summit on out of school children and even to what affects you even more directly and that's the price of cooking gas uh, which is seriously competing with the price of petrol. How are you coping with that? Nigerians had begun to say that perhaps they would return to cooking with uh, charcoal. Uh, is that a very healthy option? Of course, we've had that conversation before. Maybe not sufficiently enough. Perhaps we'll be returning it 
But let's have your thoughts now as Jeffrey joins me for a review. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. So and much, Nigerians Jeffrey. have been talking about it. Uh, I, I, the, the cooking gas part, I'm happy the government is thinking about what to do because that is at the bane of a lot of things. Kerosene is expensive now, cooking gas. That's why people are saying that CNG issue. Uh, I hope it's going to stay affordable as, for as long as possible uh, at, at the end of the day. Um, of course, the ministerial issue, uh, as far as this is concerned, and I saw that the Senate is saying they want to have a summit uh, for out-of-school children. I, I don't know what that means, actually. A national summit. I don't know what it means to have a summit on the out-of-school children. We, we, have, Just, we have state ministries of education. So what does it mean to have a summit? We have commissioners for education. Is it a talk shop? Is it, what exactly is it going to produce? Maybe a paper? I don't know. Just get the work done. Uh, the students are out the of school. Funds were necessary. I, I don't understand that. Anyway, let's let's hear from uh, some of the things you've been talking about. Uh, where the minister works, uh, Mr. David Umai has issued a seven-day ultimatum to Julius Berger mm -hmm. to accept the federal government's offer uh, of a particular amount of money for the completion of a 82-kilometer section of the Abuja Kaduna uh, Zaria Abuja Kaduna Zaria Kanu Road. Uh, the first reaction is coming from Kes. What if the money is not enough for them to deliver very quickly? I understand it's to the tune of uh, 740, 740 billion naira plus. So I don't know whether these issues are around variation because sometimes when you enter a contract uh, due to inflation and all of that, cost of materials or whatever cost of, uh, uh, entity or variable could actually change. So contractors can come and say, uh, the initial amount is not going to work. So the next one, Bukola. Well, this next one is from No U-Turn who says, are you reevaluating re their contracts based on your depreciating currency? Do you think they already have a stock of all construction materials right from the day of the original award? How about wages of their expatriates? At Dave Umahi, Nigerian currency is dropping daily. I believe he meant to say in value. Oh, that, is but, where, that is where premium comes in. I am great uh, well, this. Some people would beg to differ as far as the pricing of contracts is concerned in Nigeria. Some people believe that you know, they're over bloated and some ministry officials may be profiteering from the process because if you check according to international standards, if you go to other African countries, for instance, the pricing of contracts is way lower than what is quoted in Nigeria. All right, so let's... perhaps we need a benchmark, a standard benchmark okay. for the pricing of um, contracts such that taxpayers' money will be effectively utilized. I'm great, this. Uh, what are the options available that can be that can do the same job or better if we have, let's uh, use our other options, our options if we have the amount, if we feel the amount is small. We'll probably have the next one. Blue Stack says they abandoned most sites because of your unstable Naira and bad economic policies. They keep reevaluating costs week after week. Of course, we I, cannot, we I cannot rule out that. Inflation plays mm -hmm. a key role. That's yeah. why there's something called variation in contract. Uh, let's talk about the big one that we've been talking about. Uh, ministries that have been scrapped, merge sacking appointment redeployment and all of that so when i looked at the list some people looks like a downgrade others mm -hmm. look like an, an upgrade, upgrade. <laughs> anyway california says is this a name but that's your name by the way <laughs> this could indicate a shift in policy priorities curious to see how things will impact governance well um what's the next one now muhammad uh he's saying reorganizing ministries and creating new commissions won't transform anything it's just rearranging the furniture on a skipping or sinking ship. What Nigeria needs is zero tolerance for corruption, transparency in governance, politicians held accountable and jail for embezzlement, confiscation of ill-gotten wealth, leaders who prioritize the nation's interests over personal gains. Until we address these fundamental issues, we're just scratching the surface. Well, Clem says, for me, the real issue lies with agencies that have overlapping functions. I believe these should be either scrapped or merged to enhance bureaucratic efficiency. Uh, Topo says, I may personally not love the bulky appointment, but the merger and scrapping of some ministry is commendable. Uh, reading through, I loved it aside the Ministry of Livestock, which should be under the Ministry of Agriculture. Mm. Well, Omoya teacher says, if the, that's a long one, but I'll just try to summarize. If the ministry is merged, the employees may still be there, even though the ministry may not exist. That's true. That goes to the heart of the Steve Orosani report. Uh, well, uh, sh they continue by saying, if the ministry, so does that imply that the federal government is preparing to lay off a large number of employees in some of these ministries? And they conclude by saying, first, sports development in the country will suffer a significant setback 
and many Niger Delta militants will return to the creeks. Well, that depends on the ingenuity mm -hmm. and creativity so, of the new so, of the sports commission. So uh, things do not have to let's suffer. See, let's see how that plays out because I'm sure the sporting community is reacting to this. But uh, also the fact of the Niger Delta Ministry, you know, they have all this proliferation of uh, development commission intervention agencies. So you can also look at it from the part of maybe repurposing it to now oversee. Uh, well, the analysts will do all that. The yeah. federal government has dropped the money uh, laundering charge against Binance. Let's see what we can take just two from there. Voxel says, it be interesting to know what led to this decision and what it means for crypto regulation in Nigeria going forward. A voice says the Nigerian government's decision to drop money laundering charges against the Binance executive shows how the cryptocurrency rules are changing. This could make people more confident in the market and lead to more people using decentralized finance. This could create new opportunities for financial innovation. But another question that should be asked is, is this a mistrial? Uh, you know, why waste the time of the executive uh, for, a, for a, a trial that never got anywhere? And then the negative image that he has had to suffer as a well, result of Well, uh, he's within his right. If he wants to sue the government, he's within his right to do so. But they've let him go on held grounds. And also the fact that he works with the company, doesn't have a broader understanding of the financial operations of the company and all of that. So when I read the, I, I haven't seen the everything, but what I read is what I'm inferring. But hey, uh, let's get to that big conversation for the day. We're going to start off with the sacking, the reappointment, sorry, the re reassignment, and the hiring of new ministers, as well as some uh, appointees. Uh, we'll serve as special advisors, and of course, the scrapping and mergers that we've seen mm -hmm. and repurposing of ministry, if you like. So all of that is what we'll be talking about. Don't forget, you can join us um, on our WhatsApp. Just send your message on our WhatsApp number. I'm sure our producer will put it up at some point in the program. So you can also have your say, or you quickly go to X, where we read from, hashtag CTV Morning Brief. Let's hear your thoughts. We should be able to take it sometime within the program because it's our country, it's our nation. Our president has made a decision. What's your reaction? That's the first focus. As we take this break, we'll be right back. Join us again.
Welcome back to the Morning Brief on Channel's television. And so we're starting with the big conversation. The much-anticipated cabinet shakeup has finally happened. And you know, prior to this time, the president had made it clear that uh, ministers that were not delivering on the promises of the administration will be, uh, you know, will receive the big stick. And the w big stick has been wielded finally. We've seen reassignments. We've seen some ministers dropped. We've seen ministers redeployed. We've also seen repurposing, as Jeffrey has said, mergers of new ministries. So we wonder, has this met the expectations of Nigerians, of particularly pundits that have been monitoring this process? Let's quickly take a look at, um, you know, this shakeup. Uh, let's have a close look at it. The sacked ministers, of course, are uh, Uju Ken Ohaneye, Minister of Women Affairs. We have a new minister there now, Lola Ade John, Minister of Tourism. Professor Tahir Maman, uh, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Minister of Education. Abdullahi Mohamed Gwazu, who formerly held Minister, uh, Ministry of State, Housing and Urban Development. And of course, Dr. Jamila Bio Ibrahim uh, also um, is no longer Minister of Youth Development. Ministers reassigned. Dr. Yusuf Tonko Sununu uh, has moved to Ministry of State for Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Reduction. Dr. Morufu Olatunji Alausa is now the Minister of Education. Barista Bello Mohamed Gurunyu is now Minister of State for Works. Professor Abubakar Momo is, uh, retains or is now the Ministry Minister of Niger Regional Development. Of course, we know that um, the Ministry of Niger Delta Development has been scrapped and we now have uh, a, a supervising Ministry of Regional Development that will oversee all of those commissions. Uh, Uba Megari Hamadou is now the Minister of State for Regional Development and Dr. Doris Uzoka Anite has been moved to the Ministry of State for Finance to become Minister of State for Finance. Senator John Owaneno uh, has been moved to the Ministry of State Ministry, ministry to the Ministry of Trade and Development, but will be the Minister of State. Uh, just a few more. Iman Sulaiman Ibrahim is now the Minister of Women Affairs, and Ayodili Olawande is now the Minister for Youth Development. The ministers designate a few of them. Dr. Nentawe Yilwatda is now the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Reduction. Uh, Mohamedou Megari Dingyadi. Uh, who served in the former administration, by the way, uh, is now the Minister of Labor and Employment. Uh, Bianca Odinaka Udumegu Ujuku is now the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs. Dr. Jumoke Oduwole is now the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment. Just to cover a few uh, of the redeployments, uh, new appointments, and of course, the high point being those who have been sacked. And joining us to have this conversation is Mr. Chibuzo. Uh, Okereke, uh, public policy analyst who joins us from our Abuja studio. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Okereke. Thank you so much for coming through. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. Yes, uh, it's good to have you. And I believe a good place to start would be that, of course, this has been much anticipated, but it didn't meet your expectations, um, particularly with the repurposing of the ministries, uh, the merger of the ministries, because that was also some of the high point of the conversation. And in terms of the efficiency or lack of it of you know, some ministries that were being looked critically at, did it also meet your expectations? Well, uh, what I would say first is that this is probably a progress from what we had in the last administration, where ministers were left or even abandoned in office for eight years as if they were elected uh, representatives of the people. Uh, in terms of wh whether this is major, I think that uh, uh, sacking of only five ministers uh, it represents just 11% uh, shake-up within the, within the system out of 45. And uh, for me, uh, it's go there's good thinking around the policy, but it's uh, a piecemeal uh, approach. There are also some of the new people that have come on board I would say that they cite many people because of their professionalism. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Dr. Jumoke, who is now the Minister for Trade and Investment, uh, having worked in the last seven years as the public uh, chairperson, uh, working on the ease of doing business environment, and now going to take the infrastructure they have built within that uh, 
uh, policy sector to the for trade facilitation, trade negotiation, and investment. I think that was a good uh, decision by the president. Uh, but what, uh, if I was advising the president, having uh, Senator Eno uh, at the trade and investment, I don't think probably that will serve the right purpose. Uh, maybe he should have joined Festus Kayamo, SAN, at aviation and oversee the non aeronautical component of the Minister, Ministry of Aviation and, uh, and uh, Aerospace Development. Also, a good decision within this is merging that of tourism and the creative economy. Of course, the, the purpose of culture, arts, and the creative economy is to booster your tourism. So there was uh, no need to have those two uh, ministries in the first place. So imagine it. And in any case, the Minister of Tourism at the time, in the last one year, I don't think any Nigeria can say this is where she has been. So we couldn't even uh, point out some of the major steps within that sector. Also, if you look at the issue of Ministry of uh, Regional Development, I would say that it's also unnecessary to create such ministry, and that also underpins uh, the challenge we are having with our uh, federalism and maybe the weakness of the, the local government and the subnational levels to carry the burden of governance. Uh, if you have regional development bodies, you don't necessarily need a regional ministry at the federal level to deal with these uh, issues. Maybe the, 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 if you look at also the current composition, the Ministry of Special Duties seem not to be working or probably they don't have a portfolio of assignment to execute. And some of these efforts of government are under special intervention. So, Maybe special duties ministry, instead of creating a new regional one, would have been responsible for overseeing the regional commission that have been created. The same thing applies with that of livestock development. I mean, since we now have regional development commissions, and the, the, under the Land Use Act, which is the main issue around this livestock development and value chain, the Land Use Act empowers the governors, and the governors are advisory board members in the regional commission. So we would have had the, the livestock uh, uh, ministry embedded within the mandate of regional commission bodies and overseen by that of special duties. Since we are dealing with cost of governance, trying to bring efficiency and more effectiveness in the way we address uh, you know, governance issue in the country. That of youth also very critical. For whatever challenge, I think the minister of youth did not embody the spirit, the energy, and the innovative abilities of the Nigerian young people. So maybe I think there was need for a, a, a major uh, a, a shake up around there, elevating the Minister of State for Youth, who we'll watch and see. But most of us expected almost 50% uh, turn around within the ministry's uh, shake up because. In the last one year, as the president had observed himself, it also became difficult for the ministers to go out and communicate government policies, talk about what they are doing. Most of them were not just accessible by the people and completely ignored many media calls to engage. So I think that on that <coughs> ground, the progress you know, has been made. There are a lot of other expectations that uh, Nigerians have and policy commentators like us also have to make sure that things are working. And uh, within the I design of our governance system, we must begin to realize that ministers do not operationalize policies. They are policy promoters, advisors to president, and policy supervisors. So our energy should really be on getting our agencies to work more effectively. And mm. I must also be on Ministry of Power, Ministry of uh, Marine and Blue Economy, communications needs strengthening, and a lot more ministries, too, if we are going to get it right. All right. Yeah. I'm Zalker. Okay, so uh, we, we've seen a couple of things that have happened uh, in the last few hours, as far as this is concerned, as you've alluded to. Uh, sometimes you even wonder why certain ministries need minister of state. So ministries like minister, uh, Ministry of Youth Development, why do we need two ministers? 
Minister of the FCT. Why do we need two ministers? Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we've also seen that the lady has been taken away because uh, you hardly see her. Uh, the, the boisterous personality, perhaps, of the FCT minister may not have allowed her to shine and all of that. But that's another kettle of fish. What I want to find out from you, uh, the president is a politician. So how much of politi politics uh, played out here in terms of the political consideration and the technical value being brought to the table? Like a lot of people have said, including you have said, for you, your numbers are quite high. Half of the people that, that are ministers uh, maybe should have been removed or reassigned. I'm not sure what you mean by 50%, uh, because we see underperformance across ministers. Maybe we'll get to that list of yours that you think should have been removed entirely. But what political consideration as against technical value addition that do you think the president looked at in, in making this decision? Well, I know you're not the president, but from what you see and where you sit. Well, that's a good question. Now, first of all, the president is a politician and is also uh, the president of the Republic of Nigeria uh, with both capacity to administer politics and also capacity to administer governance. So I would say I pointed out the appointment of Dr. Jumoke to Ministry of uh, Trade and uh, Investment. I think for me, that shows also a good thinking that politicians maybe can see what is right and good and take decision to bring such a person on board. But in terms of uh, moving the Minister of, the, of uh, Trade and Investment to that of to Minister of State for Finance. I also think that maybe that account for good decision in the fact that, one, uh, the Ministry of Finance has been manned by physical-oriented experts minister. Uh, and there's need for complementarity and blending with uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Having Dr. Ozoka, who has monetary policy background, join him as Minister of State could account for a decision that is probably technical and for governance effectiveness. Uh, moving uh, Senator Enno from sports, who declared himself after the Olympic that the sports ministry uh, cannot bite, can't even do anything, that everything about sports rests on the federations. So uh, probably he is the one who uh, may have opened the doorway for the president to scrap that uh, <laughs> ministry completely. Uh, but what I find, moving him to trade uh, and investment uh, could be a political decision. Uh, maybe, like I said, he could have been moved to aviation as minister of state, and he will focus on the non-aeronautical component of the aerospace development, which is not quite receiving attention. There are the minister there, is doing a lot with the other components for well, that of the aerospace development where we can create a value chain. Nothing much is happening there and maybe that. So also appointing the former governorship candidate of, uh, I, think, I believe, of the APC in Plateau State, uh, Dr. Tawanda also, to Ministry of uh, uh, Humanitarian Affairs. I believe there is a challenge there. Not that he doesn't have capacity to execute the affairs of that. But also, there is a reason in the last uh, eight years, or si from 2016 to date, we've had women govern that office. It's also because of the nature of the humanitarian crisis that we face, our culture and tradition. He will not be able to enter certain places in the north, console the women that have been affected, because from statistics, women are most affected with some of these humanitarian activities. So maybe a consideration uh, should be looked at in that regard uh, so that uh, we will have a, a, a complete balance. But there's nothing a president who is seeking a second tenure can do that will, rem even if he consolidates on governance effectiveness, it's also to reinforce political power because he's the president and he wants to return office in 2027. So you can't remove politics from any decision. Well, Mr. Kirike, uh, the same question can be asked about the ministers that were sacked. So how much of political consideration um, inf informed this, um, the choice of this list? And how much of performance or lack of it 
inform the choice of this list? And you can ask that question specifically of two ministries. Uh, the former Minister of Women Affairs, Uju Kennedy Ohanenye, uh, the minister of, uh, former Minister of Education, Professor Tahir Maman. Uh, perhaps you have some interesting views also to share about the other names on that list. Well, uh, what I would say first is political consideration, yes, performance, yes, both variables contribute to why uh, some of these ministers were laid off. Uh, the Minister of Education, for instance, uh, we have to continue to look at this in terms of our federal design, you know, uh, uh, and the subnational bodies, and where education is within the legislative uh, list. If you look at it closely, federal government are simply in charge of federal institutions, uh, regulations from the NUC and the Unity Schools. And uh, the, from what we have gathered, the the minister there, yes, the former vice chancellor, former director of the uh, 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 Nigerian Law School or so. But over the last one year, the major policy he decided to bring out could have been uh, one of his uh, major setbacks because the policy was not progressive. <laughs> At the time, we are talking about over 20 million out of school children and the effort major effort seen from that ministry is about how we can limit the age uh, for people to go into university no matter how brilliant they have you know performed i think uh, and a lot of other issues where you know just like in the sports commission in education we have similar thing the unions are so powerful they decide a lot of things uh, that even makes the education ministry unable to make a positive impact. But the man that has been deployed there, who is the former Minister of State for, uh, for Health, Dr. Latunji, I believe, is bright, and uh, maybe he will be able to uh, make some impact within that system. For the Minister of Women Affairs, uh, Dr. Hananya Kennedy, she has been in the news several times for both the good uh, and other uh, reasons. She's one of the ministers most people are credited to be effective, adopted a different approach in a uh, women ministry in terms of empowering people, and she raised a lot of complaint, I believe, that will not go down well with uh, politicians, and also you know, engage uh, 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 like a uh, uh, face-off with the House of Rep Committee and a lot of other things. So probably issue of temperament, uh, addressing uh, how uh, certain public offices should be handled could have come. But also there is this uh, news about our office or so not quite getting along well with the office of the First Lady. So maybe there is need to even scrap anything women affairs. Um, the First Ladies should be appointed to oversee that responsibility. That way we can see them bring their women power to move things. And because they are spouses to the president or governors, maybe the ministry will get a better right. attention. And like uh, that of tourism, I told you, most people did not even know we had minister of tourism. With all due respect, maybe she tried to do a lot, but the way the ministry has been vulcanized, it became difficult for her impact uh, to be noticed. So uh, on the whole, there are issues of performance, there are also issues of politics. All right, uh, Ms. Alkerike, I know that we had the Minister of Tourism sometime. Uh, I know at some point, without making excuses for her, but just for public information, she had health challenges uh, for a period and all of that. But the decision has been made. But at the end of the day, it's about delivering good governance. This is, uh, that is the bottom line. Who and who should be in cabinet to help the president deliver his mandate that is promised Nigerians that he will do to make the life of people better. Look at the way things are in the country. Uh, the policies of government uh, that have been executed since he came into office has had a lot of impact, especially negative impact. And they are saying this is in the short term and the long term is going to get better. But the argument is back and forth between the people and the government. So I, ask, I said that to bring to the fore the fact that if the president sees what is going on in the country and I'm sure he takes it seriously, who are the people in your view that are still in cabinet that, are, that shouldn't be there. 
Well, you know, I would say that uh, there are a lot of considerations for appointing people to cabinet. Uh, I wish it's a development and uh, governance and technical decision, but it's not so uh, because of politics. So mostly the intervening variables include political support, political, uh, uh, you know, uh, support by, by key stakeholders, contribution uh, to electoral victory, capacity also, because that somebody is a politician does not mean he's not, he, can also, he cannot be a technical person. Uh, so I think that uh, these are the issues. If you look at marine and blue economy, I want to believe that it is only politics, uh, co political consideration that is probably respectfully uh, uh, keeping uh, that. This is a very novel ministry that have just been created that should bring revolution uh, in terms of our coastal uh, value chain economy, marine economy, and the blue economy. We are not seeing that. And the president, there are other ways to compensate political associates and actors that should be looked at. Every Nigerian today worries about the Ministry of Power. In, some, in one of your uh, uh, introductions, you talked about a motion that have been taken by the House of Rep to investigate the uh, uh, failure of the national grid, you know, almost every time. That of power, it has been a very big challenge. That ministry should also be looked at. Yeah, what are the hindrances? What are the issues? How can the person be supported or be shown uh, uh, without any personal thing? Because we're analyzing governance impacts. You know, there's nothing personal about it, but Nigerians can attest that we have not seen a policy shift that is progressive in the Ministry of Power, and that should change, you know, drastically. Even this particular uh, blue economy, uh, rather, uh, creative economy, art and culture that we have uh, merged now, we should also look at that ministry properly and ensure that the people they are fit for purpose are ready to deliver. It's not enough to roll out the destination uh, 2030. What are the low-hanging fruit? What are we delivering today to bolster culture and tourism in Nigeria and attract foreign direct investment? If you look at communications, I think communications also need some kind of reinforcement and support. There are issues here and there. For instance, we spent billions of dollars to build a digital bridge institute to churn out manpower in tech industry and probably take over the tech space in, uh, in Africa. However, only two or three of these institutes are working now. That of Lagos, I believe, uh, Abuja, and the Kano that was recently attacked. That of Enugu in the Southeast region is, has been taken over by grasses. And what, this is a full institution, completely built, with generators, with halls, classrooms, uh, hostel accommodation, and what have you. But it's in a state of comatose at this time. It has never functioned since the day it was built. And that of other digital bridge institutes across other zones. There are also issues within other components of the communication uh, sector. So I believe that also needs proper reinforcement uh, by the president. It may not completely uh, uh, lay them off, but they can reinforce maybe those who need mm. uh, Minister of State to support them and take over a component of their responsibility, or other experts can come in to mm. play a role. But more importantly, it's good that the President should utilize the Policy Coordination and Resort Delivery Office more effectively. Mm. The void of politics, let us see a governance system that is accountable and mm. that is able to deliver to the people, resort that is based on empirical assessment. Mm. Other political considerations can play on mm. the ground, but delivering result and governance. And I believe this is probably why the president, after one year, has made this decision, though peace me, better effort than what we saw in the last eight years of President uh, Buhari. And you know, Ms. OKK, some of the um, last few points that you have made underscores, uh, underscore my next question, which is about 
how, whether or not this cabinet shakeup reflects the um, administration's commitment to implementing the Steve Orosai report on cutting the cost of governance. And some would, um, as a result of that, ask, do we need the ministers of state, for instance, which, and we've seen about five, re four reassignments of some ministers to, the, to becoming minister of state. And you said earlier, you know, some things about the livestock development. Uh, some would ask, what is the need of that additional ministry in the first place? Because agriculture um, in the first place, um, you know, there are arguments against it about um, the activity being domiciled in the states, particularly with support of the Land Use Act. So uh, would you be supporting the advocacy for a scrapping of the Ministry of Agriculture such that the funds can be deployed um, to, in, in addition to other allocations to those states where the activity is taking place? Yeah, this argument has been on for a long time uh, in terms of uh, who are, are their citizens of state or federal government? Why do we seem to be dividing Nigeria across federal and state and what have you? Who should be responsible for what? Is the major, major challenge, you know, uh, the affecting uh, the development planning and even actual development in the country. They seem to be overwhelming federal institutions playing the role that state government and even local government are supposed to play. At the point we are economically, both macro consideration and, mic and micro issues, I would not advocate for scrapping of uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. However, there are a lot of agencies under agriculture. We have to reevaluate their contribution to economy, maybe to research, to development, to, uh, and how they are intertwined and uh, show kind of uh, technical support to state agencies and local government uh, agencies. It, we cannot have federal agencies just operate, you know, at the federal level, especially when the output of their policy decisions and actions are supposed to benefit state and local government. So there should be a kind of integration at that level so that whatever policy output they produce is consummated at the state and the local government level. That is the big challenge we are facing you know, uh, today. You, you, in, in terms of this uh, Federal Ministry of Livestock Development, I can argue that it can function more effectively within the regional development commissions because we have seen that effort to create special ranches didn't work. Mm. We, they tried to amend the, some water resources agencies at to create special area for this issue of livestock development. It didn't work. Yes, attention on livestock can probably bolster the economy of that sector and develop us beyond the issue of cows who can go into goods. Attention can come. But what really is, is uh, Southeast Development Commission not East Development Commission, if this important component of our development cannot be embedded within those regional commissions and they drive it and develop it. And they will have the Minister of Special Duties supervise them. That is what is key, I believe, that uh, we should do in that respect. And you mentioned about Orosaya report, yeah, 2013 or so. Up till now, since that time, about 500 and so we have created more agencies, you know. Do we need them? Most of them, we need them. Some of them uh, that have been in existence, we also look at their mandate. Unfortunately, we make laws in this country. Some of the laws we make are supposed to have sunset clauses mm. and not live in perpetuity. That is the biggest challenge. Certain laws are terminal laws. When they, uh, they, you bring them on board, they function for a period, and then the sunset clause is supposed to apply. And some mm. people start saying, oh, mm. we're going to lose our job. Let us do something and make sure it continues to live. Mm. That is the biggest challenge. And that challenge right. goes to the National Assembly. Right. When agencies are to be created, we look at the value of that agency. Should they live in perpetuity? Should they have sunset clauses to make sure that within a time period, right. they deliver their mandate and they exit 
at this stage so that we'll stop carrying uh, 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 more load within mm. our system. But I really think that the way Nigeria is structured today, we need a more uh, governance relationship, not just political, mm. between the federal, state, and local government so that we can drive a development, uh, you know, properly. Mm. Like uh, that of Ministry of uh, and indeed, Housing and Urban. Mm. You, can, you can tell that we need that ministry to function with the local... If we develop housing at the local government level, we we'll both start the rural economy. That's yeah. not happening. And it's a big challenge. Uh, and indeed, there's a need for more, you know, connectedness between these ministries and the people such that, you know, the promises to deliver on the dividends of democracy are felt by the people uh, who elected uh, the elected that appointed these appointees in the first place. We want to thank you so much, Mr. Chibuzo Okereke, for your time and contribution on the program. Mr. Okereke is a public policy analyst. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Cheers. And from this point, we move on to the next leg of our conversation. We'll be looking at that sore thumb in terms of security in the Southeast, the sit-at-home order. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, let's now move away from the federal to the subnational. this time the southeast region where it has been encumbered with the issue of sit at home order uh, by the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra. Just earlier in the week, they had said people should stay at home for two days. And uh, it's been an issue for over two or three years now. And the agitation of the people uh, for what they want. But the state governors in that region are saying no. Uh, what you're doing is affecting mobility, it's affecting commerce, and this is where industrious people. And so that has been the bone of contention uh, since this whole thing has started. Of course, you know the issue of Nnamdi Kano and the release and all of that. But I want to see how far-reaching this confidence-building measure by some of these governors uh, is actually helping to give the people some motivation to come out, especially on Mondays. Uh, but today we're going to be talking to the people from... Anambra State, the Commissioner for Information, Anambra State, joins us, Mr. Law Mefoy, joins us via Zoom. Mr. Mefoy, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you. Good morning, Nigerians. All right. Welcome. So let, let's begin with an assessment of uh, the impact of some of the efforts by the Governor Soludo-led Soludo administration on this particular issue, because uh, whatever affects the Southeast affects Nigeria because we are all one Nigeria. And at the end of the day, from every Monday for maybe two to three years now, this issue has been there. And you can imagine the economic loss as far as people not going out. And these are very industrious people as far as Nigeria is concerned. So this going out to say, come out and sell your wares, sell your goods, nothing will happen. Is it really working? Help. You are right. Um, the problem has been on for uh, two to three years now. Uh, if you do the math, um, it was declared, uh, I think, 30th of August, 2021, uh, following the extraordinary rendition of Onamdekan from Kenya to Nigeria. That uh, happened, I think, July 17th, uh, December 2021. And since then, till now, there has been um, sit at home um, in varying uh, degrees. Um, yes, the governors of the Southeast are worried about that because of the economic implications, particularly Governor Chuku Masoludo. Um, he has adopted a measure. Yes, he gave an order that the market should open, but uh, it's following through, um, going beyond the law and order enforcement to more solution. What uh, Soludo is doing is uh, what you may call a confidence building. It is uh, moving from market to market to encourage the traders to come out and trade. It is not uh, wielding uh, the big uh, stick or holding the hammer. No. It is saying, come, come out. I will ensure security so that you can... Um, allow with the southeast, uh, particularly Anambra economy, to run on an even keel. 
And um, that is a non-kinetic approach or persuasion, which I believe uh, is the way to go. Um, the success, I can measure it based on the people we see. Yes, all the shops are not open, no doubt. But uh, increasing number of, of shops are opening uh, because uh, each market we visit every Monday, we are received by traders. And um, where the governor addresses them and uh, reassures them that um, they need to really reopen. This is not to say that the uh, governor Soludo is uh, um, unaware of the reason why we even have the citatum in the first place. No, he is uh, worried about uh, the detention, the continued incarceration of Nam de Kano as much as any other Igbo man. Perhaps more than most Igbo men, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, since uh, uh, Nam de Kano was uh, extraordinarily renditioned back to Nigeria, Soludo is the only Southeastern governor that has uh, visited him to the best of my uh, knowledge in uh, the DSS uh, detention facility. And uh, if you even uh, go uh, back um, in time, uh, in 2017, when Nam Dekano was held for the first time, Soludo was the first Igbo leader to visit him in uh, Kuje prison. I know so because I was with him on that trip. And uh, thereafter, he addressed a world uh, press uh, conference in Chelsea Hotel in Abuja, demanding the release of Nam Dekano. And that began the process that culminated in uh, his uh, bail in, and the rest is history. Now, the uh, extraordinary condition, which you may call a state uh, kidnap or court. You see, there is a reason the governors should be concerned, particularly Governor uh, Chuguma Soludo. And I want to reduce the reasons to figures. You know, as of December 2022, the International Center for Investigative Reporting, ICIR, reported that we had had 71 citatum uh, in uh, the Southeast, resulting in the loss of 5.3 trillion, reduced to dollar based on the exchange prevailing then. It was 12.2 billion dollars in one year in fact in less than one year i'm projecting further it, you know the same uh, peer review projected that by august 2024 the southeast nigeria could have experienced about 300 citatome events and this will result in a loss of revenue of about 20 trillion naira. This is serious. And uh, there is also another peer review done by SBM Intelligence. It, it, it said that the Southeast region, you know, looking at the transport sector alone, was losing 10 to 13 billion naira in the transport industry alone every day. Now, if uh, this uh, peer review is not understood, our own SMEDA and the National Bureau of uh, Statistics and Report noted that the Southeast would lose or had lost an estimated 75 billion naira every Monday and on nano and micro businesses alone. You know, so if you, if you go on and on and on, you will see that the, the, the uh, Southeast economy is hemorrhaging. Anambra economy is hemorrhaging. And there is a need to All really right. review All like right. this. You know, but that doesn't mean, no, no, just one minute, sir. Okay. That not um, pushing for the release of Anam I have told you things he has done. He has gone to the DSS detention facility. All right, Mr. Mifo, I, mean, I, mean, I, must, I must have to butt in here. My, my apologies. All right, let, let me butt in here because I have another guest joining us from Abuja studio, Mr. Henry uh, Mbachu, member representing Orca South. 
He joins us from Abuja. Mr. Ambachi, thank you so much for coming in. I'm sure you've listened to your brother and Honorable Commissioner uh, for Information in Anambra, Mr. Law Mefo. And uh, I don't know what your perspective is as far as this issue is concerned. Because we've seen, I, I know I've seen governors of Anambra. I've also seen the governor of Enugu as well. At least those two I can remember who have gone out to, you know, some confidence building measure. And when you talk about the Southeast, if you want to distribute it accordingly, in the big hub of markets, Aria Aria in uh, Abia State, uh, uh, and then the big Onicha markets in uh, uh, Anambra State. So the impact is quite huge in some of these states. So with what you've seen and where you're sitting, I know you're in the Labour Party. Uh, is it working as far as you're concerned? Uh, good morning. First of all, let me start by correcting my name. My name is Nigeria Harry Mbajo. Oh, okay. Uh, That's interesting. Nigeria comes first. <laughs> uh, good morning, viewers. And it's nice to be here. Uh, this sit at home always, often at time, is a very delicate issue to discuss. I've listened to people discussing that and uh, only few people have been able to extinguish uh, personal interests, politics, and all what to, to the core, to the core issue surrounding Sita Home. Sita Home was organically introduced by the people. Though it was not, there was not enforcement of it. It was when the government wanted to resist it then the bad uh, element bought the story up and started using it to show maybe show of power against the government, start running kidnappings and all what not. But the, the story around it at home is story of hope. Now the Carlos, um, now the Kano arrest, a rendition to Nigeria. Uh, people were trying to show their anger, and Sitato was declared. When all this thing started, I asked, how many of the same brain are in this story? One particular thing about us in Ibo land is that once we see anything about agitation, we withdrew. I will plan to be sent. Um, Nadi Kano was not the only one doing agitation. Uh, Sandy Bo was also there. But the leaders of Yoruba Nation were part of Sandy Bo's agitation. You have to be there. You have to be involved for correction, for direction. In the case of what we are suffering now in the Southeast, it's abstinence from, of the same brains. We are called the same brain. Uh, not that the other side is not sent to, but uh, we are, whereby the leader is supposed to be involved in the IPOB stuff and uh, give direction, give protection when necessary, and even give extinction when it's needed. Now, it's in the hands of the people we can actually control, and they're using it for various things. But having said that, you see, the very vital thing that drives the economy and society is hope. I don't want to dwell in the numbers of how much we have lost and how much we have gained, because uh, I don't trust the data that are coming from uh, uh, that uh, southeast. Uh, it can it can difficultly tax the market. We are not effectively tax them. So how do we know the figures? Uh, but this projection. But what we have lost, actually, which is bleeding, is human life, is hope that people have to, in the system. Uh, we also lost um, the strong value of uh, words that's of a governor that's supposed to be a law. All right, Mr. Ambachu, without trying to uh, butt in, just my question was, so that we, we manage time, the effort of the government, is it far-reaching enough uh, so that we can, we can continue? I'm hitting there now. Uh, the effort of the government is to encourage, to encourage the citizens to come out. Uh, but, but the citizens are not taking it. Maybe the message, the message was passed wrongly. Uh -huh. 
I, I would have heard the governor saying, if you don't open on Monday, we will see your shop. Ah. If security is provided, and you encourage people to come out on Monday, be there with them, which the governor is trying to do. I think it's a good one. But what are we doing that are feasible by the political leaders that actually show the people that, okay, this is going to end? We're not seeing it. People are not seeing the effort by the political elites that will show that this will end. We talk about kinetic and non-kinetic approach. What we are seeing is the kinetic approach, non-kinetic approach. What are the senators doing? What are the House of Rep members doing? What are the governors doing? Together, cohesion, not in isolation. What are even us, the House of Assembly members, doing? It's going to be a cohesive approach towards it so that people can see it. Not when A is doing this, B will be telling another story. We have to work together to do, to ask for release of Ola and Kano. Honorable Nigeria, paramount. first but, of all, uh, we must establish that um, the indigenous people of Biafra group is a proscribed group. And, you know, to that effect, we can also talk about uh, the declaration of Mr. Simon Ekpa as a wanted person, his arrest in Finland and his release. So it's a proscribed group. But you have you spoken to, you know, some important issues, which is the lack of cohesion among the governors. And, and that's where I want to dwell on, really, uh, because... We saw a few months back the governor of Imo State leading other Southeast governors to meet with Mr. President, in fact, including other Igbo leaders to meet with Mr. President on the concern about Southeast security. And I believe um, the sit at home order was one of the huge talking points, I imagine, at the meeting. The question is, why haven't we seen that cohesion among Southeast governors? Is it is it to do with the, the fact that this sit-at-home order, sometimes we see it effective in um, southeast states like Anambra and Abia and Eboi, because the recent ones we have not quite seen in Imo and Enugu. So is there a disconnect among uh, the subnationals in that part of the country? Well, the Saudi Governors Forum, forum um, visited the president. And uh, I was expecting, personally, I was expecting them to go further. Did they visit? Did they have conversation? Did they have discussion with uh, maybe representative of um, the proscribed group? You proscribe them. That does not mean they're not existing. You are the governor of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Nothing stops you from seeing anybody to stop anything. So... What we're actually saying is, the force is kinetic, carrot and stick approach. Can we give in a carrot to these people? How many of this governor knows them? How many of this governor has discussed with them? It's, uh, it's, it's very difficult for you to take out a story that even the originator of the story, Nandekano, does not have grip on anymore. Nandekano, as from the prison detention, said no more sit at home. But it's not enforcing. It's All not right. enforceable. So, People so, are still sitting at home. So that's what you expect because to see. For more, them, of, more of the carrot no approach. That's what you expect to see. Let's take it now to um, uh, Mr. Mayford, the Honorable Commissioner for Information in Anambra State. Um, you have listened to him. And besides that, um, was the demand for the release of Namdi Kano, was it top on the agenda in that discourse between Southeast governors and the federal government that was held uh, a few months back? And if not, what, what, what is the current state of the demand for his release? And if he's released anyway, will it be at the end okay, to this sit-at-home order in the Southeast? Yeah, it was certainly top on the agenda. And um, that shows that uh, the issue is uh, beyond uh, the Southeast. The national uh, issue is a political issue, and um, you just recognized and recalled Mr. Mifo. Oh, that, uh, okay, I think he's back now. Yeah, I said 
that um, it's a political issue, it's a national issue, it's beyond the Southeast. What the Southeast governors should do is what they are doing, putting pressure and working through the back channels. Many of these things cannot be put out in the open in the way and manner many would want it. I'm aware that my own governor is reaching out. He has written letters to the president. He, he is pushing. And other governors, I believe, are also doing the same. And um, you see, the issue of um, sit at home is quite uh, delicate, like uh, um, Honorable Nigeria, Baju said. Yes, it is. And um, many people don't even want to discuss it because uh, it's a very emotional one. Many who are sitting at home would want to open their shops, but they also would want to see now they can release. You know, you can see what may appear to be a conflict of interest. And um, the governor of Anambra State, that is the person I can vouch for, is uh, seriously concerned. I have told you that he has gone to see Nambi Kano in the DSS facility since he was uh, extraordinarily renditioned from, from uh, Kenya. And uh, he is doing much more. But he also thinks that we need to review the seat at home and uh, begin to really uh, open uh, up uh, the shops and uh, release the Southeast economy, especially on Mondays, as we work on, uh, as they work on the diplomatic and um, uh, political channels to get this sorted out. You know, there are also other reasons, even for my own consideration. When the seat at home started in 2021, August, when they declared what they called the ghost uh, Monday, I had advised that sit at home would be most effective if we organize it in, uh, in, in, in Abuja, where now the country is held, where the president of Nigeria is held, that doing it in the Southeast, you know, uh, 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 the, the president, but, President Tinubu, he doesn't feel it and all that. Mr. So Mifo, I, had I, I have, that a, I have a quick follow-up question to that. If yeah, indeed um, the release of Namdi Kano would move the needle, he himself has said from where he is that there's no more seat at home. He has encouraged Southeast residents to go out on Mondays. So why has that yeah. not made any well, significant well, impact? Say, some, people, some, some, some people, some of his supporters don't believe what he has said. They believe he did that under pressure. And that is why we are saying release Namdi Kano unconditionally let them come out so that once you do so you will erase <clears throat> that correlation some people are building uh, between the insecurity in the southeast right. and uh, his incarceration if he comes out he will help in restoring peace and order and those who are using him as an excuse can no longer do so that will ultimately reduce in right. the southeast that's my belief all right, Mr. Amifo, uh, at the end of the day, the bane of this conversation is the economic loss, but more, important, yes. the, more importantly, the lives lost uh, that Mr. Nigerian Bachelor has mentioned, because you can't quantify life at the end of the day. So let me take it to Mr. Ambachu. Right. Uh, Mr. Ambachu, let's see how we can diagnose this as effectively as possible. Maybe you help us. So I don't know whether a study has been carried out so, to know the mindset of the people. Maybe you can respond. Why do they sit at home? Is it because of solidarity with Nam de Kano or intimidation by the militia elements or ineffective assurance from government? What exactly is making people to sit at home, in your view? I'll pose that question to Mr. Mefa as well. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, but you just give me a little time for me to take you through the, the history lane. From there we can... Maybe just talk, two minutes. Just uh, two minutes. What, why people are actually sitting at home. So, uh, first, Nandi Kano came with one of the best stories that uh, people listened to. People felt marginalized, and he was telling them at a point, he's the only non-charismatic, non-religious leader that can actually organize people without paying one naira. Uh -huh. People gather, people follow him, he has followers, people listen to him. So at some point, he was arrested in solidarity, out of will. People said, okay, they declared it at home for him, everybody obeyed. No enforcement. Nobody enforced it. Everybody obeyed, sit at home. Then 
there was resistance from the government side. No, we can't be sitting at home. Not every Monday. Everybody should go to work. Bank should open this and that and that. Then the, 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 the ESN sprung up. Eastern um, Security Movement. They sprung up and started enforcing sit at home to assure people that the government, they are in charge and not the government. And it was happening. They were killing people, burning things. And they burned, enforcing it. I, can, I could remember, gradually, sit at home was almost gone. It was almost gone. Two years ago, Oka, some banks in Oka were almost opening. Markets were opening. And uh, when uh, during the governor's inaugural speech, he also visited the city at home. And that sparked it up again. I think what we should do is less zero um, um, publicity on our actions we are doing to bring back Mondays as an active day. Less zero publicity there. Let's not politicize it. Let's not publicize it. Let's do our work mm. as legislators, executive, or even uh, as uh, the judiciary come together, do their work mm. and play, play background so that people will see organically Mondays, everyone will start coming out on Monday because it has happened. Mm. Two years ago, we were almost coming out on Monday, part of on the Chanoka. So, Honorable Before, Nigeria, people, in... people don't like when, when, when you come confrontational with what they believe in. All right. Now the Kano story was a belief. Then secondly, he needs to come out. Everybody, all house must be on deck for him to come out. A competent court has given him bail. Yes, he's being held in detention now, unconstitutionally. All Igbo, all well-meaning Igbo and Nigerians should be speaking for Nandi Kano to come out. I think if Nandi Kano comes out and say, sit at home, it's over. Any other person that you see that is a first citizen can be dealt with as a criminal. Mm. That's my stake on this. So, so in, in further diagnosing this, uh, we've heard uh, reports about this sit at home that some uh, audio messages are circulated, video messages are circulated of un unidentified people calling for the sit at home. So in further diagnosing it, if, if people readily comply with this, it shows that there's a level of fear that has been um, sort of in, in, in perpetrated in the atmosphere. Who are these people? Let me take you to on the Honorable Commissioner now. Do we have a, a, an idea of who these people are? And this question is important because the proscribed group has distanced itself from uh, the sit at home order, not directly by Mr. Namdi Kanuna, but by the group itself. A certain name is being quoted, Mr. Imar Powerful. So who are these people? Yeah, it is quite um, instructive that uh, the known uh, factions of IPOB, none of them called uh, for the two-day sit at home that just uh, concluded and uh, that proved effective in uh, many parts of uh, the Southeast. Um, I, I saw the video. The man I saw there, I never saw before. And, um, you know, the, the fear, like you rightly identified, people believe the believe the, the man. Um, he made a very wild, very, very wild uh, claims that uh, the Biafra agitators were going to test their newly constructed uh, armored tanks and things like that. And people believed and stayed away. And uh, that um, uh, Monday particularly, the governor of Anambra State, in his confidence building, um, had to put on hold the State Executive Council meeting and moved from market to market to encourage people that, look, you just have to come out while we continue our diplomatic maneuvers back channels to see that the Nam the Colonel comes out. Everybody wants him out. And uh, the people who are capitalizing on, her, on uh, his detention to perpetrate what they are perpetrating in the Southeast, for me, I see them as criminal elements. They, they don't they like uh, Ndebu because he's more powerful. Never, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the spokesperson uh, for the IPOB uh, re-echoed what Nandikano himself said. 
that there is no more sit at home. So those who are doing that are no longer doing that in the name of Unamdekano because Unamdekano himself says no sit at home. The spoke say uh, passing and the leadership All of right. IPOB also said that there is right. no more sit at home. Let me quickly just add this. Yeah, in just 30 uh, in seconds. In 30 seconds. Yes, in 30 seconds. You see, the effort to bring out Namdekan will have to be better orchestrated. The governors, we want uh, the uh, members of the uh, National Assembly to join the governors. They need to form a team. And just they shouldn't leave it to the governors alone. They must join forces. They shouldn't wait in the wing for the governors alone to succeed or fail. Doing so will uh, be right. atavistic. They are not helping the security situation in the southeast. They have to All wake right. up. All right. I, I must thank you so much. At the end of the day, why we brought this conversation to the fore is, again, the loss of lives, the uh, grounding of business and commercial activities on Monday, given the fact that the people are quite industrious, uh, with also due respect to you know, the intent of the people that are making agi agitation. Uh, but we've also mentioned the fact that the federal government has proscribed IPOP. Uh, but we must thank you, gentlemen, uh, for coming on the program. Uh, Mr. Law Mefor, the Commissioner for Information and Ambraste, thank you, sir, for coming on the program. We appreciate it. We also want to thank, thank uh, you, uh, Mr. Henry, uh, Nigeria Henry Mbachu, member representing Oka South uh, One Constituency. Your name is quite interesting. Is that your is, is that your government name or is an adopted name? Just in one second, <laughs> I'm just curious. That's my name. Oh, fantastic! Thank you for coming on the program as well. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so we will take a quick break and uh, get to all of the serious issues, and now get to our creative industry. For the record, we now have Ministry of Arts, Culture, Tourism and creative economy. One of the persons in that industry will be joining us. Joining us on the program, Mr. Kewe will be right here to explore filmmaking and what it takes. Join us again. Welcome back. And so borrowing from the words of our first guest on the show, really the Ministry of Arts and uh, Culture is supposed to project the Ministry of Tourism. And really, uh, that's the essence of uh, the conversation. If you look at uh, that entire space, it's about storytelling, telling the Nigerian story and selling Nigeria to the world. And one sector that has been selling Nigeria to the world for decades now is the arts and entertainment segment. So we're going to be celebrating a storyteller in this segment. Uh, let's welcome Mr. Keve Uguje, a filmmaker and um, uh, a founder of an, uh, uh, an equipment company. Am yeah. I correct? Yes, equipment rental company, yeah. Yes, yeah, so let's, let's start really from um, storytelling, which is the, you know, the heart of the conversation. And Nigeria has you know, been selling its stories, particularly mm. you know, with zest especially in recent times, and there's an interest in that space. So for you, uh, are we effectively uh, telling the Nigerian stories and owning the space as well? Are, are the um, Nigerian creatives owning enough of the shares in that space? Are we selling all of our you know, uh, intellectual property, all of our originality to the international community, and indeed the rights that come with it, with it as well? Um, so, well... It's a great privilege to be here to start with, basically. Um, I believe in the words of a very popular pastor, to be useful, you have to be used first. Um, I believe we're in the phase of being used. Our intellectual property is being used. We're selling a target. We're selling a market. We're selling a people. We're selling an industry. And we're selling a continent to the world at large. Um, a few things may not go our way at the moment, but we're building. And storytelling is the fastest way for us as a people to change the dynamics, change 
change how we're perceived in the international community, in the world at large, even to ourselves, uh, from coming from where I've lived in, which is the United Kingdom. <laughs> it's very difficult to be a Nigerian and be proud to be a Nigerian. I'm not even going to say some stories that happened recently at a very popular embassy, just because I'm Nigerian. You know, so storytelling has really given us, entertainment in general, has given us a very new lease of life in the international market. <laughs> and trust me, there's a lot of money to go around. There's a lot of funds. Uh, there's a lot of um, revenue generation in that industry. Even in Nigeria, look at the workforce. They just use Lagos as a case study. Look at the workforce of young people, even old people, in entertainment, be it music, be it film. We're all telling stories. The musicians are telling stories. The actors and producers are telling stories, all to make Nigeria better, to also to earn money. But if you look at the, 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 the gap that we've covered, it's, it's huge. Imagine if entertainment, storytelling, entertainment at large wasn't existing. A lot of people would be out of jobs, myself inclusive. You know. It's quite interesting the way you pose it. I, I think I've never heard somebody say the way you said it. And, and it's almost difficult not to agree with you that sometimes you have to be used before how did you put it again? Yeah, so to, to be useful, you have, you have to, to be, be used, used first. It looks like that's the phase we're in because if you contextualize it, I'm always comparing it with the highest, which is uh, California. Yes. Now, California, for instance, at some point, perhaps still now, uh, as a state, has a bigger GDP than 54 African countries. True. California had about $3.3 trillion in terms of their GDP. That's mm. almost the size of the GDP in Africa. Mm. And there are just two industries responsible for it. Silicon Valley, which has to do with tech, and Hollywood. And Hollywood, yeah. So that speaks to the potential and the power. And, and in fact, I dare to say that issues around filmmaking and creative industry generally is part of foreign policy of the Western country. Yes. How much of that do you think Nigeria is tapping into? Because it looks like government is playing catch up. Uh, we've seen some efforts, but how much of uh, presence are we really pushing beyond, beyond the hype? Because the average American is respected, not because all of us went to America, <laughs> because we just watch film. Uh, we are afraid of having issues with some of the Western countries because of the image they put in our head. How much of us are we putting in the minds of other people in your view? At the moment, we're, we're really trying, like you said, we're playing catch up in almost every aspect of of the word catch up in Nigeria, for instance, you know, from politics to entertainment, we're still playing catch up. And I think now with the likes of people like the Moabudus, the Kunlef Alliance, the Kewa Gunjes, we're beginning to change the, the, the landscape of things because for the longest, we're trying to meet up to Hollywood. We're trying to tell foreign stories in a Nigerian context, you can't do Hollywood better than the, than the Americans. You can't do Bollywood better than the Indians. You can only do Nollywood better than the Americans would do Nollywood. You know, so we are not telling indigenous stories. We're telling stories that um, 50 years from now, we'll look back and say, oh yes, yeah, this happened in 2004 or 2020. Do you understand? And we're beginning to have a very huge impact. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm not allowed to call figures. There was a time you that earning a million dollars was just a dream. But now it's very, very normal in the entertainment industry. I'm, I'm a beneficiary of a streaming platform um, buying my content for amounts that are not insulting as in previous times where, you know, you do, uh, you put out a body of work and somebody's offering you peanut because they're offering you in USD, in dollars or in pounds. And for us here, we'll feel like, oh yeah, we've arrived. But sometimes what we earn for a 90 minute film is what some people earn for a 30 seconds gig in America. We can never, we've, not never, we've not reached the level of, let's say California, as a whole, just a small borough in California earn more than and generates more than because it's very important to generate and earn. Generate more than the whole of Nollywood. Mm. Put Asaba, Enugu, the epic Yoruba guys, Lagos together. We don't earn as much as a borough in California. 
What about, what about um, the actors, for instance? The producers, producers make some money now because, you know, we can, actors, an actor like Denzel, for instance, can earn as, in a small budget film, as much as $20 million. What's the total budget hmm. of Nollywood films? Income and expenditure. What's the total budget? And, and you know, Kevin, that's the heart of the matter, really. Yeah. And I wonder if industry experts are rethinking the options of owning the space more. I go back to that question. Um, would there be a need for a seed fund to have something homegrown, um, so, such that we're not taking all of our own intellectual property to the international streaming platforms? And we, indeed, we had some of them before. Or is there an intentionality in ensuring that the cinemas thrive such that you know, we can continue to create value such that we can have films like Tribe of Judah that hit one billion naira at the box office? Um, for that, for, there's, there's a five letter word, T-R-U-S-T, trust. And I used to say, because we're getting to a phase now where um, the young people, by young, I mean people from 18 to 45, 50. They're the ones that are now becoming the leaders in this aspect of um, business. Um, if we have trust within ourselves, we can, it's the biggest capital in the world, trust. Uh, government has tried to intervene, there's some seed funds. Anytime those kind of things come up, it's like what people say. I don't like to say what people say. It just goes to a few people. And the fact is, it is those few people that will now decentralize these seeds. And a seed is supposed to germinate and bear forth fruit. But when a seed is now kept in the cupboard mm. for personal use, then it's mm. no more a seed. It's just gratuity. <laughs> <laughs> or, you understand? For so, one individual. Yes, a lot of these initiatives have come up. And with trust comes confidence. Every business needs confidence. It, 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 it's, it's easier for, I mean no disrespect to my elders in the industry, it's easier for a bank to give a loan to an agriculturist or a farmer than to give a loan to a Nollywood practitioner because we're still building that confidence. There's a bit of trust now because people have seen inflow and outflow don't lie. The money that comes in doesn't lie. We're not strong enough to run independently. That's why we still go to the international community to bring in USD, because we don't have a lot of exhibiting platforms to buy our content. Uh, distribution is a problem. I'm sure you guys would have heard this a lot from practitioners. And government is trying. <laughs> government also has to have confidence in, which is why there's tourism, there is, you know, things like this happening, the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. They're trying their best, but the people need to have trust and confidence uh, in itself. I, I wanted to ask you whether, but I, we're going to take just an excerpt of your work, and when we come back, mm. I want to find out from you whether, if from where you sit, whether government really understands what is required mm. because there's that place mm -hmm. of just having uh and all of these uh measures but there's a place of understanding what value brings to the table or it's just tokenism uh, maybe we'll just take a quick uh, excerpt of one of your work on this particular one it's our fifth anniversary okay i i can't imagine having an anniversary without sugar Going to the supermarket to get some blue sheets. Yeah, I don't think it's blue sheets. Follow like this, then she can't go like this. And now no concern again. She can be easy now, let My wife is blue sheets. It's just that after one year, it's looking like this woman is gone. Uh, well, I, I, I'm tempted to ask you how much uh, the streaming platform bought it from you, but you can say that if you want to say. Uh, it's up to you if you choose to say, because I know that LIRS is listening. Yes, <laughs> LIRS is listening, FRS is listening. Yeah. So. All the IRSs. So, I, I hope you pay your tax. Uh, before, send, send me a DM. Yeah, send me a DM. Because the governor is the one who comes and asks you. By the way, I was asking whether yeah. you think government really understands. But great work you're doing. Must thank commend you. you. Great thank work. you. I appreciate Thank you. I think government understands, but the question would ask is who is the government that understands 
who uh, is, is one thing for gov government is not just one person it's a, it's a combination of people we are governments the community people so the, the guys at the top they may understand but the the, the middlemen between the guys on the top and people like us do they understand um, for instance I'm, I'm about to film in in, in South Africa uh, um, January or February I know how much I would pay mm. to film in South Africa. And the reason I'm doing that with my full chest is when I go there, I'm extremely sure of security. I am extremely sure of the technical talents that they are giving to me. I'm bringing, of course, I'm a strong-headed filmmaker. I'm bringing some of my people from Nigeria. But I am very, very confident of the South Africans and what they offer. Can I say the same thing about Nigeria? I really like to propagate us in a, in a positive light. But can a, a Kenyan, for instance, come to Nigeria and say he wants to go and shoot in the north? You know what's happening in the north. Is it safe? If they come into Lagos, would traffic allow them to achieve what they want to achieve? Well, to speak for Nigeria, it's not every part of South Africa that is safe anyway. <laughs> I understand that, but for the larger parts, right. as an international filmmaker, mm. it favors a lot of people. And it, I can't say the same about that. Um, tourism in Nigeria, Ministry of Tourism or um, Arts and Culture, what are they doing? Mm. To, to, to ensure that this is a safe haven for filming. What are they doing to entice investors from outside in yeah. the entertainment and industry? And that would be a fine place to live it, particularly now that we have a Ministry of Arts, Culture and Tourism. tourism. And tourism. Arts, tourism. Culture, Together. Tourism and Creative Economy. Yeah, and yeah. A very long name. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's actually very good. Yeah. If you streamline these things, it, it makes decision making faster. Oh. It makes communication faster. So yeah. I, I think it's a good, good initiative All from right. whoever. All right. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. Uh, it's been a great honor having you. And we love your stories. We <laughs> look forward to seeing more of them. We've had uh, Keve Ogunje, filmmaker, uh, joining us on this segment. Thank you so much for Thank your time. Thank you. Thank you. So, Minister Ms. Musawa has heard that, and we hope that she reflects on some of these points that have come through, particularly from this segment. And this is where we anchor the show for today. Thank you so much for watching. We will be back again tomorrow for the home stretch. I am Bukola Koka. Thank you so much for your time and company. And we hope that with the rejigging of the cabinet, things will get better for our country. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Sunrise Daily is up next at the top of the hour. Bye-bye.